Good evening. We're going to begin with hymn number 322, please. Hymn number 322. I hear the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. 322, and we'll stand after the introduction. Let's stand together. going to come before the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll have a few favorite hymns, but let's still our hearts before the throne of heavenly grace. Eternal God and loving heavenly Father, how we thank Thee and praise Thee for that lovely chorus we've been able to sing. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but the Lord Jesus, He washed it white as snow. And, O God, we do praise Thee and thank Thee for our redemption tonight. We thank Thee that we have a Redeemer. We thank Thee that we have one that purchased us, purchased us as His own people, that now we are a peculiar people, a special people in the sight of God, and we praise Thee that we are not purchased with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but we have been purchased with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank Thee that there is redemption through the blood. We thank Thee that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin, not just some sins, not even the majority of sin, but we praise Thee that all sin was paid for, for all of His people there upon Calvary's tree. And how we rejoice in the privilege that is ours as the people of God to come and worship Thee tonight afresh, at the Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. And, O God, we do pray that Thou give us help. Give us help even as we sing Thy praises. Give us help as we pray later on. Give us help as we read the Word of God together. O Father, apply it to our souls. And, Lord, we ask that Thou bless the preaching of the Word of God. We ask that this would be a blessed time. Lord, save us from just going through mere emotions. Save us from just doing what we always do, because we've always done it that way. Oh, Father, we pray that our worship may be completed 
at the end of this night in spirit and in truth. We pray that we would put our very all into it, not just going through the motion, not just going through ritual or tradition, but, but having the heart, soul, mind, and spirit and strength put within it. Oh God, help us to give our all in our worship tonight. And we pray that thou would help us to do it in truth. Lord, there's no good doing it in spirit without truth. And in a sense, no good doing it in truth without spirit. But we pray that thou would help us to do things aright in our worship of thee tonight. We pray that this would be a blessed time, that thou give us great strength, even as we come about thy word. We pray that everything said and done tonight would be God-glorifying, and we ask that thou be pleased to put away the distractions and the various hindrances that would cloud our minds and tear us away from the things of God. But Lord, remember those that are suffering tonight. We do continue to remember our brother Billy and we remember Jill. We pray that thou bless them and comfort them. And we pray that thou would even be pleased to save souls that were in at the funeral service and have been long prayed for by the family circle. Lord, answer prayer tonight. Lord, we ask that thou would undertake for others that have been bereaved. We remember the priestly family circle. Be with Eileen and David. We pray for the McCrackens as well, afresh. We pray that thou be with Janine and Leonard and the children. Lord, there's so many, and they're feeling, they're feeling grief at this time. We just ask that thou be pleased to wrap thy loving arms about them. Give them that peace that passeth all understanding. Remember those that are sick tonight. Lord, how we pray for those that are laid aside. They need a healing touch from thee. Lord, we pray for those that are, in a sense, seriously ill, and we've been praying for them for a while. We ask that thou touch them. Now, and also there are those that are laid aside just in recent weeks with coughs and colds and infections and different things like that too, that ordinarily would be at the house of God tonight. We pray that thou would help them and bless them. But Lord, undertake for our need now. Help us to be well-pleasing in thy sight as we bring our worship unto thee. We plead these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, do we have any favorite to start us off? 323, 323, a lovely hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. We'll sing the first and last verses, a lovely last verse there. I love to think of these words. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. First and last, keeping our seats. Three, two, three. Have another three five four three hundred and fifty four. We'll sing the first and last again as we keep our seats. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Three five four, first and last.
another. 625, 625, another familiar hymn and beautiful words we find here. Always a wonderful comfort. 625, we'll sing verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 of 625. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 625 verses 1 and 2. truth and another one six eight one six eight and uh, we'll do the first and last verses we'll make this our last and it's a lovely hymn to make a prayer as we come about the word of God 165 first and last breathe on me breath of God fill me with life in you that I may uh, uh, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. One six five, first and last, we'll stand after the introduction. Oh, six eight, six eight. Sorry, bro. Sorry. Let's see. Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. Well, just as good. Amen. So we'll sing that one. <laughs> Sorry about that. One six eight, first and last. Let's stand again. Many years since I sung that one and I'd nearly forgotten the tune there, but lovely peace. Send the fire. Surely that's our prayer tonight. Lord, 
send the fire. Now, we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth and chapter 4, please. The book of Ruth, chapter 4, and we're going to read together the first 10 verses of this wonderful chapter. And here we are in our 16th message in the book of Ruth, and we're looking at the title today, Our Kinsman Redeemer, Our Kinsman Redeemer. And we have a, a wonderful, wonderful truth before us, and I trust it'll be a blessing to your soul as we think not just on Boaz, but as we think on Christ, our greatest kinsman redeemer. But Ruth chapter 4, beginning at the verse 1, the word of God states, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat, down, and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of, uh, of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, and tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Uh, therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabites, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of this place. Ye are witnesses this day. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his precious word to each of our hearts. I'm sure you remember the story by now. We've looked at it this many times. But Elimelech and Naomi went to Moab. We find that from every pointer in the word of God, they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have left the promised land. Nonetheless, they took their two sons. Their two sons married. And ultimately, their backsliding resulted in three funerals. Elimelech's funeral, Malon's funeral, and Chilean's funeral. And Naomi was left with their two daughters-in-law. And we find that uh, they journey back to Bethlehem, Judah. One of the uh, daughters-in-law, Orpah, she goes home back to her parents, back to her false gods. And in chapter 1, Ruth is converted to Christ. And she comes to Bethlehem with Naomi. In chapter 2, we're introduced to Boaz and all the grace that he gives, freely gives to this young lady, Ruth, and then this wonderful account that we've been looking at in recent days on the threshing floor, this, this exchange, this blessed exchange between both Boaz and Ruth. And we find in the verse 11 of chapter 3 that wonderful promise that Boaz gives to Ruth, and we see so much of Christ in it. It says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And how often Christ has come to us and said, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. And of course, the greatest fulfillment of those words for the Savior was at Calvary when he did all that we required and he shed his precious blood. But there was a problem, if you were to remember. Uh, there was a, a bump in the road, a, a slight issue to contend with. And chapter 3 in the verse 12, we 
uh, came to this verse, and we said we would deal with this verse later on as we came to chapter 4. Well, we're going to do that now. Ruth chapter 3 verse 12 says, And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. And there was this, this bump in the road of this love story in that sense where Boaz is keen on marriage, Ruth is keen on marriage, and yet there is this, this near kinsman, this closer individual. And here we read in Ruth chapter 4 of Boaz meeting with this nearer kinsman. Boaz meeting him at the gate. Boaz advertising the land that is for sale and also telling this man that if you buy this land, then you also, as a condition and as a stipulation laid down by Naomi, I don't believe it was a legal stipulation, we'll look at this later on, but a stipulation laid down by Naomi that if you buy all this land, you must take uh, Ruth to be your wife as well. And this other man wasn't interested. And we find ultimately this exchange that takes place at the gate where one takes off his shoe and the deal is made. And Boaz uh, seals the deal in that sense and buys the land of Naomi and ultimately purchases uh, Ruth to be his wife. Now, when we come to this portion, we, we find a wonderful word here. Now, look with me in Ruth chapter 4 and the verse 1. It says, Then when Boaz up to the gate and sat with him, uh, sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman. Now, you see that word, and that word is repeated throughout this book, this word kinsman. Now, that word kinsman in the Hebrew is the word gall, which can be translated to mean to redeem or to buy back. And what a wonderful word that is. In that sense, behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz spake came by. Now you think about that. When you think of this near Redeemer, and Boaz also as a near Redeemer, and that's the idea, that's the word in the Hebrew, to redeem, to purchase, to deliver, to rescue a person or property. Now you say, is it really that word redeem? Well, come with me to Genesis chapter 48. I'll give you an example because this exact same Hebrew word is found here in Genesis 48 and the verse 16. And look at the way it's translated. And sometimes we miss these things. When we look at our English translation, I, I would imagine uh, the Jew, when reading the original manuscript in his mother tongue, the Hebrew tongue, would see more than we do. And it's a wonderful thing to delve into it if you can. Because look what we see here. Hebrews, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> Genesis 48, verse 16. It says, The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Now you see where it says redeem there. That's the same word, gal, which means kinsman, which was my kinsman in that sense, my redeemer, the one that redeemed me. Now come with me over a few pages to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, and in the verse 6, we find this same word, gall, in the transliteration. It's G-A-A-L. That's how you would write that Hebrew word in the English sense. And it says in Exodus 6 and the verse 6, uh, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. Look at it. And I will redeem, or I will be a kinsman. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And especially with that last verse in Exodus 6 and the verse 6, we have this idea that you're in bondage, this idea that you have had to be sold out into bondage, that you, you're uh, away as a slave, you're in chains, you're in shackles, and this idea that somebody comes along, pays a price, and buys you back, and buys you into freedom. That's the idea of the word redeem. Now come with me to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25, and often when we preach the gospel and we come to the gospel service, we we use certain words and we sort of use them interchangeably when really we shouldn't do that. We think of the word redeem, we think of the word salvation, 
we think of the term born again, and we, we interchange these things as if they all mean the same thing. Now, they're all referring to the same thing, what Christ does in, in liberating our souls from sin, but it gives a slightly different angle each word. And look what we find in Leviticus 25 and the verses 47 through to 49. Just an example of what redemption is. This idea that somebody who cannot do anything else has to sell themselves into bondage and someone comes along and buys them back. That's the idea. Look at Leviticus 25 and the verse 47. It says, And if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family. Now, do you see what's happening here? In the verse 47, we find there's a rich individual and there's a poor individual, and the poor individual cannot make ends meet and cannot put bread on the table, and he decides to sell himself, sell himself into the rich man's hand, into bondage. Then look at verse 48. It says, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now, do we not see a wonderful picture of the gospel in this word redeem, in this word kinsman? Now, when we consider it and we think of Leviticus 25, verse 47, this individual, this someone that has been sold into bondage and slavery. We, we sold ourselves out for sin. And the wages of sin is ultimately bondage and then death and then judgment and then hell. And all of us are in that bondage. All of us are in those shackles in sin. And we read, for uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know this. We know the dangers of sin. But then in the verse 48, we find that one of his brethren may redeem him. Now, do we not see that in Christ? One of his brethren may redeem him. Now, who did Christ become? Christ became flesh for us, became in that sense one of our brethren. He became an elder brother to us. He, he, he became human flesh and was very man of very man. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. As we leave Leviticus behind, 1 Timothy 3 and the verse 16, it's important to note the, 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 the things that are going on here concerning the kinsman and this idea of kinsman or redeemer, that it was a brethren, a, a, a someone of near kin that came and could buy him back. Well, that's what Christ has done for us. 1 Timothy 3 and the verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God is manifest in the flesh. What was the Lord Jesus Christ doing at the incarnation? He was essentially, by becoming human flesh, becoming a real man, very man, very man, what was he doing? He was becoming one of our brethren. He was becoming of near kin unto us. He was representing us. He could do that through the incarnation. Then come with me to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6 and the verse 20. I want you to see this. And what was he doing? As one of our brethren, we could say. 1 Corinthians 6 and the verse 20 tells us that he came. He came to be a man, came in the incarnation, came as a human being, a real, actual human being to pay a price, to pay a price for his people, for his brethren in that sense. 1 Corinthians 6 and the verse 20 says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The idea of redemption in slavery, somebody has come, has become near of kin to us, bought us with a price. What is that price? Well, you know these words. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed, same word, with corruptible things as silver and gold. And then it goes on, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot, uh, a blemish and without spot. Then come with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And why is this the case? Why is this the case? 
Why did Christ, why was he willing to ultimately become one of our brethren, to become of near kin to us? That was the purpose for the incarnation. Why was he willing to pay the price? Why was the ultimate uh, price paid in the sense the blood of Christ was used to pay for our souls? And then we read in Titus chapter 2 and the verse 14 exactly why he did it. It says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the background, verse 13 tells us that, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our uh, Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself, look at it, that he might, note the word, redeem us from all iniquity. That's the bondage we were in. And purify unto himself a peculiar, a special people, zealous of good works. And what a price it was that he paid. This is the idea of redemption. This is the doctrine of redemption. And it's interesting, and I'll just turn back to it myself, but you know what we read in Leviticus 25 there when we read that one of his brethren, an uncle or an uncle's son or someone of near kin could come in and pay the price and redeem him. And the idea was there that, that someone could do it for him. But then at the end of the verse 48 it said, or he may redeem himself. That's something we cannot do. It's something that may be a slave in Israel in Leviticus 25 that that portion specifically referring to might have been able to do, might have been able to get enough money together. But spiritually, that's something we could never do. We needed our Redeemer. We needed our kinsman. We needed our kinsman Redeemer. You see, we couldn't do it ourselves. We needed, in that sense, a fellow man but not one touched with sin, one that was perfect, one that could come, one that could qualify as sinless and acceptable in the sight of God. And that individual was the Lord Jesus Christ to pay our debt, our kinsman redeemer. So you see, when we come to Ruth chapter 4 again, and I spend time on that deliberately to set the scene now, because what we find going on, you've got to view Boaz as Ruth's redeemer, as Ruth's kinsman. That's what she's doing. In a sense, she's, she's in the bondage of poverty and he's coming along as her redeemer to liberate her and take her unto him to wife just as Christ takes the church to be his bride. And, and it's a picture of salvation, what we're reading in Ruth chapter 4, this transaction that's taking place. And it really is quite wonderful. Now, as we look at all of this, look at Ruth chapter 4 in the verse 1. Look at this first line with me. It says, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. Look at the verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. Now, what is the significance of this location? Why did Boaz come here? Was it just a matter of uh, he might just bump into this individual, this unnamed individual that's nearer of kin to him? Is it just a coincidence? He sat down at the gate. Is it a coincidence that maybe it's a place of business? I tell you this, the gate is far more important than that. The gate is the place where justice was done. The gate is the place where justice was done. Come with me to Deuteronomy 16. And the verse 18. I want you all to turn there, please. Deuteronomy 16 and the verse 18. And this is interesting. The gate is the place where justice was done. If criminal proceedings were to take place, if any breaking of the law was to be judged over, it was done at the gate. It was done with the elders. It was done with the judges and the magistrates. There at the gate. Deuteronomy 16, look at the verse 18. It says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Now, the gate is not just as we view a gate in our society. It's not just something you come in and out of. It's not just an entrance into a property, an outer of a property. It is the seat of judgment for that place and for that people. Now, with that in mind, isn't it interesting that this transaction of redemption, this transaction of a price being paid, this transaction of Boaz 
purchasing someone in grace. Isn't it interesting that it was done at the place of judgment? What was Calvary? Ultimately, what was the cross? It was a place of judgment. It was a place where Christ bore our judgment. It was a place where Christ bore the wrath of God for our sins. It was a place where Christ, as a legal transaction, we call it justification, paid our price and liberated us from the hell that we deserve. Calvary was a place of judgment. Essentially, we see the picture of it here as Boaz comes to the gate to make this redeeming kinsman transaction for Ruth. But then what else do we find in this portion? Well, I want you to also note, look what it says in, in the verse 1. It says that Boaz, uh, he sat down at the gate, and look at it, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And then look what it says in the verse 4. And I thought to advertise thee, saying... Now, isn't it interesting that there was no underhand business with Boaz? He did it all open, and he did it all honest. Boaz was a man that had nothing to hide. There was no cloak and dagger stuff here. He did it openly. He did it honestly. He did it in the right location. And in the verse 2, it says, He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. In fact, at the end of this portion that we read together, look what it says at the end of it, verse 10. He says at the end of it, And from the gate of this place ye are witnesses this day. Verse 11, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. This is the most transparent transaction you could ever imagine. But isn't there a lesson there? Not only in Christ, but concerning our own dealings, in our Christian walk, in our Christian life, that our business transactions, that everything we do, whether it be with work, or whether it be with taxes, or whether it be with the farm, or whether it be with anything else, we are to be open and honest and completely transparent. Because I tell you this, money is something that has destroyed ministries, and money is something that has destroyed churches, and money is something that has destroyed an individual's testimony in their locality. And that's something we've got to be careful of as well, that we do things the right way and be honest and have integrity in our dealings. Come with me to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19. And look at the verse 11 with me, please. Leviticus 19 and the verse 11. I want you to see this. And we find it's a principle that we find in the law of God. And it's a principle that needs to be carried over to us. It says in Leviticus 19 and the verse 11, it says, Ye shall not steal. You say, well, I know that. It's one of the Ten Commandments, famous. We learnt it at a tender age. But look what it says now. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Oh, how many Christians have been caught out in that? And how sad it is. But we find Boaz here completely transparent. No underhandedness, no dealings like Laban with his daughters, Leah and Rachel. None of that nonsense going on here in this particular marriage setup. No, this is completely honest. Completely honest. And he lays the matter before the man. The verse 4 and the verse, uh, the verse 4 primarily. Look what it says. It says, And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants. And before the elders of my people, if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And we find almost this man thinking, you can nearly see the saliva coming round his lips as he's thinking, oh, what a deal this is. All this land, and he can just imagine it. Oh, this, this widow, she's probably struggling for finances. I'm probably going to get this parcel of land dirt cheap. You can just imagine it, can't you? You see it in the countryside all the time still, don't you? And people thinking, if I could get a bit more land, and if I could go that bit further, and maybe it'll be cheap, and maybe I could drive it down. And before Boaz has finished his sentence and finished what the deal is, he says, I will redeem it. He gets right in there. I'll take that land. 
I'll do it. Don't worry. I'll, I'll go for that, Boaz. Then look at the verse 5. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. <laughs> now things have changed. Boaz is able to finish what the entirety of the contract is. You take the parcel of land, Ruth's, uh, Naomi's stipulation rather is, you've got to marry Ruth as well to raise up the testimony and the name of her previous dead husband. And look at the verse 6. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now you say, do we have a lesson here? Do we have a lesson here? Well, yes. Yes, we do. How many have we seen in Christian circles that take this same attitude as this unnamed man, as this unnamed nearer kinsman? Or people who, who go to church, people who maybe live a good life and look good, and, and maybe they even go to church to just get the social connections in the area and, and just so everybody thinks they're doing all right and all the rest of it. And, and in that sense, they want Christianity for the good of it. But as soon as there's something that involves obligation or loyalty or stickability or something that's tying to it, they say, oh, no, <laughs> I'll take the good bits, but no, I can't redeem that to myself. Now there's actually obligation to do something as well. How many are like that? As soon as commitment and loyalty and a lifetime obligation comes onto the scene and they start backing out and they say, yes, I'll get saved today. Yes, I feel bad about my sin today. Yes, I'd love to get saved today. And they, they seem so keen and so enthusiastic and then they hit a bump in the road and then suddenly, no, I don't need the Savior anymore. I'm not going to risk it anymore. i am not got the stickability anymore. And actually you ask, was it genuine at all? They want the good of it, but when the bad comes, they say, look what it says in the verse 6, lest I mar mine own inheritance, lest I mar what I've already got, all the stuff I've already accumulated, all oh, the world, we're to forsake it, aren't we? We're to take up our cross and follow him. You know, the rich young ruler, he didn't want to mar his inheritance either as soon as obligation came around the corner. No, he said, I'd rather have this world lest I mar mine own inheritance. Come with me to 1 John, please. 1 John chapter 2 and the verse 15. Because there's so many like it. They want heaven, but they don't want holiness. They want the rewards but they're not willing to stick through the trials. And we find in 1 John 2 and the verse 15, the word of God is very clear to the child of God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Just note the verse 17 there. Isn't it interesting? And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Let's just stop there a moment. Do we know anything about this other man? Do we know anything about his riches? Do we know anything about his inheritance? This, this so great inheritance he didn't want to mar. Do we know anything about it? No. Do you know why? Because it's passed away. It's gone. But what do we find at the end of the verse 17? But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Whose name are we talking about thousands of years on? We're talking about the man who did the right. We're talking about Boaz. We're talking about the man that did his duty. We're talking about the man that was willing to be the redeemer. And this man that didn't want to mar his inheritance, we don't even have a name for that man. But we know the name of Boaz, and his memory is one that abideth forever in Christ. Oh, you know, there's, there's lessons here. There's lessons. Come with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
2 Timothy chapter 3. And we find here the same idea that I've been trying to get across. There's so many, and they like the good bits. They like what Christianity may offer when it sounds like houses and land and money and inheritance. And, and they like the good bits of Christianity in that sense. But you can't cherry pick when there's obligation round the corner, loyalty, stickability, and Christ says, deny all and follow me. There's many that say no. No, when the, the road gets tough, I don't want the Lord. We read in 2 Timothy 3 in the verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We find if we live for the Lord, then there will be persecution. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong here. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'm not saying buying a wife or finding a wife is persecution. Don't make that link. But I'm saying concerning the obligation here, when there was something more, more than just what the world had to offer, we find this man didn't want her. And why didn't he want her? Why didn't he have any interest in her? Well, we can only speculate. But I'd imagine it's because she was a foreigner. I'd imagine it's because she was different. I'd imagine because she was penniless. I'd imagine because she had nothing to offer. But isn't it amazing how Boaz looked for something else in Ruth. We're not told that Ruth was beautiful, you know. We're not told very much about Ruth that would be desirable to the flesh. But one thing we are told about Ruth, look at chapter 3 and the verse 11. All the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And a virtuous woman, her price is above rubies. And we find that Boaz had an interest in her walk with the Lord. And this man didn't. This man saw nothing wonderful in Ruth. But Boaz did. And surely there's lessons here. How sad it is when we look at Ruth chapter 4 and we look at the verse 6. This man saying, Lest I mar mine own inheritance, I cannot redeem it. I cannot redeem it. How many are like that in our day and generation? Just on the subject of being remembered. Look at Proverbs chapter 10 and the verse 7 with me. Proverbs 10 and the verse 7. Because we find the same theme throughout the Word of God. The same theme here. In Proverbs 10 and the verse 7, it tells us concerning Boaz's name being remembered. We find concerning this man that would not fulfill his obligation. We find that his name being forgotten in history. We find Proverbs 10... The verse 7 gives us the answer. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. We find it time and time again. Look at Luke 16. You don't need to turn to it. But you know, we read of Lazarus. We find the, uh, the, the poor beggar, and his name is mentioned. His name is remembered. And the rich man, we have no name for him. Why? Because the wicked's name does rot. But only the memory of the just is blessed. There's a lesson here. Which side are we on in all of these things? But you know, when we come to this, back to Ruth chapter 4, and when I think of the verse 6, and this nearer kinsman that has this statement, and it's a very serious, solemn statement, for whatever reason he makes it, I mar mine own inheritance, for that reason I cannot redeem it. Are you not glad tonight that Christ didn't take the same attitude? Are you not glad that the Savior didn't take the attitude of the verse 6? I'm not coming to that earth. I'm not coming to live for that people. I'm not coming to die for that people. I'm not going to redeem that people lest I mar mine own inheritance. Aren't you glad that instead the Savior left the heaven's glory? He left all that was beautiful and wonderful and perfect. He left the angels singing his praises. He didn't care for his inheritance in that sense that he already possessed, but he came to redeem the people, came to redeem us. He didn't care about marring his own inheritance. And well, in that sense, did Boaz mar his inheritance by buying this parcel of land? Did he mar his inheritance by by taking Ruth to be his wife, did he mar his inheritance as this man thought he would have done? Well, let's see. Look at Isaiah 53 with me. Isaiah 53 tells us concerning Christ, 
Did Christ mar his inheritance when he came to redeem us? No, he didn't. No. Christ added to his inheritance, you know. Christ added to the glory that his name receives. Christ added to his position of of authority and grandeur and praise and majesty. Christ added to his inheritance by redeeming a people. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. We find Calvary there. Verse 11, it tells us, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. We find that, no, he's not going to mar his inheritance. He's going to be satisfied, and he's going to add to his inheritance. And look at the verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We find the Lord as a divided portion with the great, and a spoil with the strong. Why? because he poured out his soul unto death, because he was willing to be the Redeemer, because he was our kinsman. Well, we say we see it in Christ, but what about Boaz? What about Boaz? Look back at Ruth chapter 4. Look at Ruth chapter 4 and look at the verse. Look at the verse 17. Look at the verse 17. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. So we find Naomi is a grandmother. Ruth has a child, a son. They call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. We find those same truths highlighted in verses 21 and 22. What do we find? Oh, I tell you this. Boaz had the greatest of inheritances. Why? Because it was through his family line that the Savior was born. The Redeemer came. Oh, Boaz didn't mar his inheritance at all. He added to it when he redeemed Ruth unto himself. Very quickly as we finish, we find as we look at this last chapter of Ruth, look at the verse 7. It says, Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming And concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. You know, as a child, when doing our Bible readings as a family, this little bit always used to fascinate me, always used to amaze me. I used to think, what a strange thing. Maybe you're thinking that right now. What a strange thing. You do a business transaction... You have this buying and selling and purchasing and redeeming. You have all this. And then this idea of a man plucking off his shoe always sort of made me smile. What's that about? Well, you see, in those days, there wasn't the writing of a legal contract. That did come, by the way. We read of that happening in the book of Jeremiah when he bought land. There was legal contracts later. But in those days, in the book of Ruth, there was no writing. There was no legal contracts per se But the legal contract was sealed by the seller plucking off his shoe and giving it to the buyer. And what's that all about? It's very simple, very simple premise, really. That man had the shoe as proof to say, it's now my land and I can walk on my land. I have the right to walk on my land. That's as simple as it is. It's as simple as it comes. That's why they plucked off the shoe. To say, now, legally, I have that shoe. This is my shoe, my land. I have the right to walk upon it. It really was that simple. I don't know if we'll ever go back to writing contracts like that. It sounds uh, very simplistic. But that's all that we find. But we find that Boaz bought it. Bought the land. Bought Ruth. And we find this wonderful, wonderful line. These lines in the verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabite is the wife of Mal. Have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance? You know, when we read that phrase, my wife, we find that Boaz purchased, uh, purchased Ruth in this deal, redeemed her, was her kinsman, and he says she's my wife. But in that sense, does the Lord not say to us, these are my people, they're my people, I have redeemed them. With my precious blood, 
I died on Calvary's tree. They're not just a people, but they're my people. And I don't know about you, but I find that a great comfort. <clears throat> Come with me to Acts 20 as we finish. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And we find this exhortation that Paul gives to the elders in the church at, at Ephesus. And he tells them to remember something, to remember that the people of God they are ministering to are not just any people, but the Lord says they're my people. And I purchased that people and therefore build them up in their most holy faith. Acts 20 in the verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased. The idea of redemption, the idea of the price being paid, he hath purchased with his own blood. I don't know about you, but that brings me great comfort when I find that I am purchased. I am purchased with the blood of God, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy 7 and the verse 6, and applies to me, thou art unholy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. We see so much here. In Ruth chapter 4, we see so much of redemption. We see so much of what Christ has done for us. And I trust that in these days, we'll be able to be a people that thank the Lord that he was willing to be our kinsman redeemer. He was willing to, go <coughs> he was willing to do all that was necessary. He was willing to say, as Boaz said in the previous chapter, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. And he wasn't one that said, I, I, lest I mar mine own inheritance, I cannot redeem. But instead he said, I will redeem it unto myself. And he bought us for him. What a wonderful truth. Verse 8, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. We trust the Lord would bless his word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. We're going to sing together hymn number 320. Hymn number 320, a lovely old hymn concerning what we've been looking at tonight, this theme of redemption. 320, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. I am redeemed, O praise the Lord. My soul from bondage free has found at last a resting place in him who died for me. 320, verses 1, 3, and 5. Let's stand again. 